I'm at the Innovative Sportsman Shop. Uh, Trey's gonna actually help me rig up the Sholey here with a uh, ultralight 1103 AC. So, should go pretty smoothly because we do have the four bolt pattern there. No inserts, but we'll just drill into this hull and uh, get some hardware in there, get that bracket on there, and I'll have the um, have the boat out on Pry Lake Marburg in a few days. Trey looks like he's got, we got a whole bunch of 1103 rock guards. Yep. Are these sold yet or? No, we're, we're caught up. We have like three in stock. So. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, we've got more powder care right now. So we're, we're, we've been doing pretty good at keeping up with those. Cool. Um, just working in and out of the shop, trying to clean up and get ready to go back to work in the shop, so. All right. You ready to rig a boat? I am. All right, let's do it. So we're not totally starting with a fresh, <laughs> brand new motor. I mean, I'm using motors that I've got yep. set up. So we're really just doing the foot control steering and we're using an old bracket. What's our overview, man? Uh, we're gonna use, since the pegs are already here in the in every Crescent kayak, um, the the ultralight, the light tackle, the crew, um, and, and now this kayak, they're already here. They just don't have the slides. So um, we carry the slides so here at the we're shop. We're taking this out yep. and sliding it in that. Yep, and then you have your sliding foot pegs. Um, for Jeff, for this kayak, I've, I've done Crescent installs before where we just take these bolts out, mount these slides in here, and then put the, the pegs back in. Well, with this, it doesn't give you a whole lot of travel right here if you have longer legs, so we're gonna mount these top side with 90 degree adapters so that he has more travel and he can extend his legs out a little bit more, but you still have you know, all this travel with the peg itself that if someone shorter were to get into the boat and wanted to try it out. Oh, so it's not hitting my size 15s at the bottom of the heel. It's right. hitting it somewhere midfoot. Yep. So we'll we'll get that and then we will install tubing into the hull and the throttle mount, we're using a flush throttle mount. Um, and the tubing will come back here and most likely come out in these, I don't know what these are called, but it, they're they're made for- We should um, call them nipples. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Didn't but say nipples. I, I, I thought might, it might've been inappropriate, so I didn't. Um, but no, so the, the cord and tubing will come out here for uh, a rudder or a motor install. And it's nice that they've incorporated that because it makes it a lot easier to mushroom the tubing. Um, yes, you can drill an angled hole into the plastic, but when you go to mushroom the tubing, it gets it gets kind of weird and, and it's tougher to do. So this makes makes the install a lot easier. Someone in the industry will put a comment to explain what's the correct terminology. <laughs> yes, <for those. laughs> I'm sure. Uh, they already have the the indents in the mold for the four bolt pattern. There are just no inserts, so we have a hatch right here where we can just take the hatch slit off, drill the holes out, and hold the nuts underneath. So uh, it makes it really easy to put a power pole or motor uh, on the back of this kayak. So um, should be a pretty straightforward install. The other Crescent kayaks can be a little challenging because there's not a whole lot of hull access in them, but this one has all the hull access that we need. So cool. It makes it nice. And I get to do my favorite thing for, for my friend Jake. Here, take the camera. Take the camera. We're gonna do this in slow mo because I got some old hardware from from Torquedo installs that um, you know that I didn't use. For instance, these these come. This, this is what comes with the ultralight 1103 when you drill through the hull, and I and I rarely do because there's so many <clears throat> so many boats that have the threaded inserts, but. 
they're in here somewhere rather than try to pick through them I get to it's it's a beautiful sound I get to do it in slow-mo because our friend Jake it just it just it just triggers him it triggers his OCD his his whatever he's got just this is for Jake hi Jake hi Jake One over. There's three over there. <laughs> there it is. I gotta take the handle off. I want to make sure they line up. So I'm just gonna use my bracket. I mean, use. There's my handle now. Right? Yep. Okay. All right. The handle removed. Trey's going to do some really cool things with the Sharpie, which is way more professional than what I usually do, which is because just point I, and shoot with the drill. Because I'd like it to be centered. The reason why I'm using a Sharpie and test fitting the mount, I'll show you. The holes will not go in the center of these because when the plastic hulls of kayaks heat and expand and they cool and they contract, the holes always change. It makes it challenging when you're doing plates and stuff. Uh, you have to always think of you know the expansion and the shrinkage of the kayak. That way, like so, our plates and stuff, we always put slotted holes in them. That way, it. it <coughs> It is. It, it works all the time, no matter what the temperature is or what you know what the conditions are. These, these things come out of the mold like a little bit, a little bit floppy. Yeah. Right? Yep. A little bit like jelly. Yeah. You had a plate that you said you're not gonna even mess with from, and we'll we'll just say an unmentionable brand. Yes. The, um, the inserts, none of them lined up. Yes, uh, they were all different. Um, there were a few four bolt, four bolt patterns in this kayak and, and they were all different. And in order to make a plate for that kayak, it was next to impossible. It would have been very challenging and very, very expensive. And honestly, at the end of the day, nobody would have paid the amount of money that it would have took to, to get that plate into production. So, um, so someone's murdering a goose over there. Yeah, neighbor's goose. There. Protective geese. <laughs> they protect their their attack goose. Yeah, yeah. Because they they have goslings, so they um, yeah, they're pretty nasty. Huh. I'm gonna go check them out later. We yeah. film that. Yes. <laughs> We save this. That is plastic welding material. In case we ever need to patch a hole. Tight fit in there? Yes. Very much so. So what are you doing to overcome the tight fit? I'm trying to wedge a screwdriver in between the nut in the back of the hull and a lot of times that'll work but it's a very awkward position to get into so you're just giving it a flat surface to to turn on yes okay is that working it's not there yet okay Your, your goats ever come in the shop with you? No. 
You're pretty close. Where are they at? They're right there. Well, they were right there. Oh. They're on the move. All right, so you're unable to get a socket up in there. Mm -hmm. And to get a, you know, to get a uh, crescent wrench up in there is maybe too tight. Crescent wrench? Yeah. Sorry. I was, I, I was taught to never use a crescent wrench unless you had to. Okay. <laughs> it is not the right tool for the job. Well, you know what I'm saying. You, I know what you're you saying. got a tight foot up in there. Yes. And you used a flat, a flat screwdriver. screwdriver to wedge up against the side of, like, so it's up in there, and you're putting this on the, on like one surface in between that and the and the side of the hull, right? Yes. yes. And then, and then, turning the bolt from the top such that it gets close enough to. To grab into the the lock, the plastic lock nut yes. part of the lock. Got it. Okay. I just need people to understand. You, you know, it's too it's too narrow a spot to get a washer or even a socket in there, or as you don't like me saying, a crescent wrench. What's what, what, what's the what's the bias there? Um. Uh. So as a kid, you always want to use a crescent wrench. And a, by a crescent, I mean adjustable wrench. Yeah. Um, and as a kid, my dad would always tell me, you don't use that if you have the proper wrench for the job because a crescent wrench will normally round off the corners of the bolt or the nut. So gotcha. um, yeah, whenever anybody says crescent wrench, like I use them, but not very often. And it's usually for large things like regulators on on the welding tanks and stuff like that but so when you hear the word crescent wrench like the 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 three-year-old version of because that's when you started welding right yeah. when you were three. I, I was eight <laughs> <laughs> but yes when somebody says crescent wrench the first thing that comes to mind is isn't there a better option than that like that's what goes through my mind well tight spot i guess you know flathead screwdriver is getting the job done so we've got those four bolts drawn in as much as we can um, what it's doing is so the hole is close to the edge here and the nut is actually wedged up on the side of here they're they're drawn down tight uh, it's just something that we'll keep an eye on once you get out in the Sun and the heat and you're running it to make sure that those nuts don't work their way up a little bit if they do they will actually insert themselves into the plastic and they'll be easier to tighten so it's just a matter of coming back and checking with an allen wrench to make sure that they're you know tight after every use so i'm taking jeff what you got a new tool oh yeah i did i'm taking these out but they're, if I try to put them back in, I already took this side off, it, it's going to stick out. So I was digging around in my my Jake drawer, and um, we're just we're going to name that after him. It, it, and I found a shorty, just because I want something to, to fill that spot, just to clean it off. So I gotta, What happens if you don't fill that spot? Uh, stuff gets in there, it oxidizes, and then you just can't make use of it. I mean, it's just... I don't know. You don't want it not filled. Dirt. Kind of like the charging port on the Torquedo battery. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so we've got four 90 degree adapters. Um, we use wing knobs with track bolts to fasten them to the track. And then I found that a 7 8 inch bolt through the 90, oh, I'm sorry, wrong way, through the track and through the 90 leaves you just enough to get a lock nut on there so you have no threads hanging over, less places for fishing line to catch on and snag and break your line. So um, a 7 8 inch bolt is what it takes to go through the track, through the 90, and to put a lock nut on it, and it's flush. So with this application, 
the track will carry the, the back 90 degree adapter and then we'll put the, the other 90 degree adapter here but the hole in the track is too far forward so what we're going to do is drill a new quarter inch hole right about here which is at the end of the track so I'm just marking it so I can drill the new hole and then we'll put the other 90 degree adapter here and let the front of the track overhang. This isn't exactly easy if you have big fingers and I don't have giant fingers. So what, do you, what are your tips for, for the, um, the sausage finger impaired? I don't have any tips. No? At all. Nope. Good luck. That's what I say. My dad has sausage fingers. Mm. I've seen the struggle. By the way, that, that's going to be the, the title for this, this video. Sausage fingers? No, my dad has sausage fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm doing some weird stuff with a 90 degree adapter. Here, here's where I'm looking at. We've done this, we've already set up this side, but what I do is I have an anchor line running all the way through this, getting all foul. I mean, it wasn't messing with the lock and load base, but it's, it's gonna rub up against this on this side, and I don't, right in this path, I got, a, I got an issue. So what I'm gonna do is put the 90 on there, and then I got these, well, I've kind of dismantled I'm I'm putting the tie down eyelet on the end of that, but I don't think I can do it with this black plastic piece. So I'm just I'm putting I'm putting this nut on there just to give it a spacer. You know what? I'm gonna stop explaining things, and you're just gonna see it at the end. This is what I needed. I just needed some separation to get this, this anchor line out. Now I gotta pull it out and actually run it through there. But it's it's important to have anchor lines rubbing on stainless steel, not plastic. Because they're load bearing and it'll just saw through all manner of stuff. So that's what we're doing. All right, so we're gonna look at where this is gonna go in. Whew, am I crossing over? I think I'm going in here. Maybe here. You're gonna lose a cup holder. I've already lost it. I mean, well, I've lost it here. I mean, I can work around it, but I'll lose it on both sides. I'll be honest, I don't put cups in them. I mean, what's in there? A mag fatties and a finesse jig. Yeah, well, yeah. I have two cup holders, one for cutoff baits and one for water. Yeah. This is, mag fatty's been in that cup holder too long. It's it's no longer mag, and it's it's it's, it's fun when they melt. I have stains down the side of my inflatable from melting Z-Man <laughs> funky mustaches. <laughs> Melting Z-Man soft plastics running down the side of my inflatable. I can still catch fish on this though. So with the the foot control steering, we try to center the, the sliding foot pegs in the track itself. With a Torquedo motor, you get about three to four inches of travel from center. So it'll go four inches this way or four inches this way. So we try to take that into consideration on where the cord's going to be. And we can run it all the way back here, but that leaves you that much steering cord, spectra cord, sticking out for things to snag on or to get tangled up in anything. But you can go here, which will put it on a little bit of an angle, which isn't terrible. But you have to also picture it's going to go into the hall and it has to go around this cup holder and then run down the gunnel of the kayak and it'll come back up to here. So if we put the hole here, it's going to put it on more of an angle to go around this cup holder. Uh, if you put it here, it's going to put it on more of an angle from from the the pegs to here. So if we split the difference, it's kind of the the you know the best of both worlds. You have less of an angle each way, and then it goes down through here and comes out on the nipples. Drill it up. So with these, I try to go in the same 
angle as the cord will be coming off the pegs. So I won't put them straight. I won't go like this, but with this rounded edge, it really gives you kind of an un unlimited angle. You can put it on any angle that you want. So I try to go the same as what it is on the pegs. Get it started, pop it through. You don't want to ream it out because you want the tubing to fit really snug. Uh, that way when you mushroom it, it forms a nice seal. So we're gonna now drill now out the rest of it. You're gonna teach us your mushrooming technique. I will, yes. Okay. So it's it, I'm gonna I'm gonna interject here. I don't do it. He's taught me it. I can do it. I absolutely understand the rationale behind Trey's way of mushrooming it out. Um, I'm a little set in my ways, apparently. I've learned it. I get it. It makes sense. The point of his and what his way of mushrooming it does is it makes sure that when you mushroom it out, you don't close up the center of the tube, which I, I open it up with a screw. But his way, I don't know. His way keeps the center of the tubing open better than my way. But I still won't change. So I use a piece of wire and I'll run it to the back. There's a hole access in the back, so it makes it really simple. There's gonna be a comment. On what? In this video. Where where do you get the wire? What's the oh what's the source? The this wire it's very stiff. It allows you to push through a kayak. It is high tensile fencing wire. Um, I get it from my local feed store. That you can get it from Tractor Supply. Uh, any company that deals with livestock fencing will have this. Um, it's a pretty common wire, but you can get it in different gauges. I don't know what the gauge of this one is. I do know that it fits very snug inside of this tubing. So what it does, it allows you to push the tubing up when they're really far, and I can pull that tubing back through the hole. If it snags on anything, I can usually pull it through. Like the Hobie kayaks have a lot of foam in them to help with support and everything of the, the hull of the kayak. It'll actually pull past that foam when that foam tries to grab the lip of this. Um, this is nothing special. It's a piece of metal with holes in it. It's actually a, um, a grass blaster blade for a, for a uh, Torquedo motor. So. Um, I just took it, drilled the hole out so it fits the wire, and I keep it on the wire. So when I go to mushroom it, I'll heat this on the very end, and then just push this, and the tubing has nowhere to go but out. It won't sandwich in like, like Jeff was explaining. It will not you know, choke down the hole of the tubing. It keeps the hole the same, and then it only flares out and stops it from pulling back through uh, when you put it in the hole. So that's the easiest way I've found. It looks the nicest. Um, I'm very picky on how things look. It looks really uniform. And actually, if you if you do this several times, you get a really wide flange. Say you're, you've drilled on an angle and you, you make a really wide flange, you can actually take your finger once it starts to cool and mushroom that tubing down and make your own nipple, as we call it. And, and it won't pull back through. And it looks clean and smooth and it's flush. So. How about a putty knife? Yeah. Because like not everyone has skin as thick as a welder, so like sticking your your finger on something hot. Yeah, my so. Not um, everyone has all the nerve endings like already dead. Yeah, before I started doing this, I was pretty pretty good with hot metal and and hot things on my fingers. Um, I have burned them a few times doing this, and um, it, it just makes them that less sensitive to heat. So. Cooks and welders have like superhuman, you know, heat tolerance and uh, you know. Yep. Putty knife. So, all right, torch it up, man. Show us how it's done. All right. I still don't have my small torch. So, still using a giant torch. Just have to be more careful because it's a bigger flame. I turn it down a little. You can do it with lighter, too. Yeah, you can do it with a lighter. That takes too long, though. I just go in on an angle towards the tubing so I'm not heating it up too much. And then push it in. And it usually takes two or three times because I heat it a little at a time. You don't want to heat it too much because then it tries to smash the tubing all at once and it just wrinkles up and makes a nasty mess. It makes a nasty mess. 
So you see it makes a nice, just yep. flat area, uniform all the way around. So that's why I do it that way. No special tools needed, no money invested in special tools. It, I made it myself. Um, so yeah, really simple. So I have the high tensile wire ran up or ran to the back of the boat. Now I need to get it up through the, through the nipple. Maybe. There we go. Pull it through. Grab my tubing, which we've already mushroomed the one end on the tubing. So what we'll do is we'll pull it all the way through until it stops. And I push it up on there as far as I can. That way it doesn't pull off when I'm pulling it through the hole. Once you get it started, pull it until you feel it stop. And then sometimes you have to just work this to the center so that your tubing comes out and you don't pull your wire off. And there it is. So now we can pull it all the way through. And sometimes, because this wire is a really good fit, it's really tough to get off. But Boom. Nice, clean, flushed finish. Once you get the tubing pulled through, I always cut extra so I can grab this with my hand. I'll show you in a second why. We do that, throw your extra out of the way. So you want to be able to grab this with your hand because your wire fits really tight. And you want to run the wire in as far as you can. And what I do is I know so I have to go in this far, and what I normally do... You just measured that out. Yeah, you? to make sure that I'm getting the wire past the hull, because we're gonna stretch this a little bit, and I need my Sharpie, which is hiding from me, but we'll make it work. Oh, there it is. Let's just see if it's tucked into your ear. It's not in my ear. That's normal, though. So we know that it has to go that far to make it into the hole, but we want to go a little farther than that because once we stretch it, we, we still want to have some of the wire passed here. So this wire, so we're there. We're going to go a little bit more. So once we get that, Jeff brought out his vice grips which are a lot smaller than mine, and I like these a lot better. So I'm gonna have to go buy a pair of these. Stretch it a little, clamp it, and then I take my knife, and I go about a quarter of an inch past the vice grips. So about right there, and I just cut them. And, and make sure you don't bump your vice grip handle while you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. And, and lose the tubing because that's frustrating. Yeah, then you get to go back to the Jeff technique with the screw. <laughs> <laughs> so then once you get that, then you can split this all the way down to where you just cut it and then stop and then it breaks off. Now you do some fancy stuff. I'd be bleeding by now. <laughs> so you have... I'd have melted plastic burning my skin and, and I would be... That's what's left. So I would have a stitches. This is where the smaller torch or a lighter comes in handy because we are close to the hull of the kayak. But if you're careful, you're good. And I only heat for a very short time so it doesn't affect the kayak all the way around the tubing. And then push. And then again. So we're almost there on the first burn of this one. And then again, leave time for it to cool. Yep. And then walk away for a minute or two. And when it cools, take the vice grips off. And then if it doesn't pull in automatically, because the vice grips do, they, they more or less, um, the teeth will make marks on this. And sometimes the tubing doesn't want to go in. You just take your wire and push it in and you still have tension. And you want tension because if there's not tension, I've done this before, the tubing will move around inside the hull. When you hit your foot peg, the tubing will actually slap the hull of the kayak and it's, it's really annoying. So um, fish can hear it, you can hear it and, it, and it's kind of frustrating. So if you do it right, 
then you will have that and you'll have tension on the tubing. So see that didn't go in? Just give it a little push and we're good to go. And then I also use this tool to pull my wire out so that it doesn't try to pull the tubing out since it's such a tight fit. But then it leaves you with a nice rounded nipple. So we're putting tubing or the, the spectra cord through the tubing, running it through the back, come out the front. And I put the clamps on the peg so they don't move when I'm trying to tie. Jeff's knot is a little bit different than mine, but basically make a type of slip knot so that when it's cinched down, it will only get tighter and not loosen up. But I just tell people you get six or seven coils on there, you're, you'll be all right. Yeah, and if you try and look up the type of knot that we tie on YouTube, YouTube sends up a warning because it's actually called a noose knot and YouTube does not want you knowing how to tie a noose knot. They automatically want to send you an 800 number so you get help. So I pull it tight and then I take a pair of pliers with mine because this really helps to cinch it down. Pull the tag in and it cinches it pretty good and then pull back on all the loops and it leaves you extra here so then you grab the main line and slide it all up tighten it down and then I trim that with scissors and with the spectra cord I have never had to burn the end with a lighter because I've never had a problem with it fraying so I just cut it and leave it and it's good to go. <coughs> so you tell me all this time I've been burning the end it's a waste of my time? Yes absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> uh, let me find my scissors. Jeff loves these scissors. You mean so, the um, you're not a man until you have a manly pair of scissors. <laughs> the, the Amish like circumcision tool. Yeah. So I'm not bashful with the Spectre. I don't ever want to run Where short. Where did you even get that? Like I, that that just. Um, my dad. Um, it, uh, my dad's a collector. He collects all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and old scissors is one of the things he has on his wall in his man cave and he has like two or three pairs of these and I needed them for something and he's like here like and I love them that they weigh like five pounds they do they're sharp like, and they cut through just about anything Stephen King wants this back from the <laughs> <laughs> as a prop for I don't know which movie but we need carabiner all right. Here we go. <clears throat> if you need carabiners, we sell the exact same carabiners. Right this is more fun. Here, let's, let's use those instead. And no. Them out. Terrible idea. I don't know. We'll use yours. Oh. Okay. There's one. There's one. There's two. They're okay. right next to each other. So, make the motor straight, and like Jeff does, he has it trimmed back a lot. It's Same knot on the back as it was on the front. It's so if you pull it down, it'll actually kind of crease the spectra cord right there. So <clears throat> Trey doesn't want me talking about what's missing. My, my. My my raise bar is missing. Mm -hmm. Why is that, Trey? We've had a lot of inquiry about raise bars bending, and if you do not want your raise bar to bend on your 1103 motor, you have to make sure that your motor is straight uh, before you raise it out of the water. That is key. If your motor's turned sideways and you try to raise that motor, it's going to pull. It's a piece of flat bar and it's a piece of aluminum flat bar. It is made to be raised in this direction, not, not in this direction. It will bend. So, so you're trying to... We're, we're testing the idea of making one 
out of stainless steel. So we have to go with a stronger grade of metal because we can't change the thickness of it because it'll change the way the triangles fit. Um, if it's too thin, it'll flop around and it makes a bunch of noise back here. If it's too thick, then the triangle will not tighten down. So we're looking at stainless steel ones, obviously, because salt water um, and just water in general. So you're <coughs> attempting to out-engineer user error. Yes, that is the idea. Okay, we've done it before. Like, well, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Same knot as we did before, and when you go back, it's still straight, and the pegs are centered on both sides. So then, we take our Stephen King scissors and trim it off. Okay. Well, we've already. I, I wanted my own, I like using this for the motor lift and I had to move this one over and we didn't film, but that splotch right there, see that dark spot? That is a plastic welding, I got one there. Cause I had to move this cleat over. That's a different um, video altogether. Anyhow, I grabbed the wrong tool. I just, only trained professionals should do this with a drill. Very easy to strip those holes. Very easy to and drop. dropping the screw is part of the process, in case you were wondering. <laughs> it wasn't ready, now it's ready. Did, did I even drill that hole? I don't think I, I don't think it. you did. No. It goes better with a pilot hole. So I'm at a weird angle too, like, we're burying this lovely track that we put in there, and it's in a funky spot. But I don't know. I just I like these these cleats. Yeah, I'll take your advice. I'll do it by hand. So that's on there. We're doing, just doing the motor lift line. All right, we sped through some of the last couple steps here, but um, there's the foot control steering. Give me some movement, man. And we got motor lift. Give me a motor lift. What do you do before you do the motor lift? Motor straight. All right. Looks good. And we got the reverse lock here. Yep. And, uh, I, I put my throttle here near the front left corner. Where do you keep yours? Um, on the left side. And when I ask customers about throttle placement and your, your rays, because we always put them on opposite sides of each other, the first thing I ask them is when you're fishing, which hand do you hold your rod in? Because it's nice to be able to adjust your throttle in the middle of a cast while you're holding your rod in your normal hand and not have to switch back and forth. So I've somewhat changed how I ask that question. I say, when your bait is in the water, which hand is it in? Because people do the bait caster yeah. switch it and they say, oh. That's a good way to put it. I'll, I'll remember that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to take this to uh, to Lake Marburg, get some speed and range. What's your guess on top end speed with the 1103? What do you think we're going to get? Six, two. I think you're right. It's, I think it's, it's going to be a low sixes just because it's not that long of a boat. It's, yeah. it's streamlined and it's, you know, I think it's a good haul for speed considering it length, its length. Right. Um, I think if you had an extra two feet of length on there, we would have an upper sixes boat. Oh yeah, so definitely. But we'll see. Your guess is six two. Uh, I think we, you know, we'll be in that range, maybe a little bit more. But I don't think this is a six and a half. I may be surprised. Maybe it's a six and a half mile an hour boat, but we'll find out.
Thanks for your help, man. That's what we do. We enjoy it. You're on the water tomorrow, right? Yes. What's your tournament? Um, we are on the Conowingo Reservoir for Delaware Paddle Sports Kayak Bass Fishing. And how are you going to win it? Um, in a creek. Very shallow water where only the inflatable can go. Okay. Um, it's It's got a combination of largemouth and smallmouth, which was what makes it really exciting to me. Uh, the mouth of the creek definitely holds both species of fish. But, um, you know, have that tournament this weekend. Next weekend, we're at the same place with MAKBF, so it's kind of a a pre-fishing deal for next weekend too, so we'll see how it goes. Nice. Good luck, bud. Thank you. All right, I'm out here on Lake Marburg. We got a little bit of a breeze. Uh, I'm gonna get out of this this area, tuck up probably against that island there um, to get good, clean, objective data. It's not real bad. I think we got maybe eight or nine mile an hour wind but I like clean data. I like honest, clean data. So I'm gonna get out of this wind. I'll go ahead and show you uh, the setup from, from this perspective. Uh, I'm happy with how I got the, uh, where I have the throttle. You know, this is a good position because I hold my hand, hold my rod with this side, this hand that I'm holding the camera. Um, this is a good position. It's out of my way. I can read it. The steering is doing good. I'm not going to get real crazy with it until later. But I'll zoom over there and get some top end speed see what we got. I'm not counting this because we're going into the wind, but it gives you an idea we're low sixes, anyways, in the wind. 6-2, Balance up. I'm going to look at the viewfinder and see what that... Yeah, that mount's dragging a little bit, causing that, uh, that rooster tail. It's not horrible, though. Yeah. 6.2 into the wind. We're almost to the calm spot. We'll get over there and get a good objective top end speed with uh, the trees on this island as a wind block. So in case you hadn't uh, picked up this this feature from prior videos, the, the 915 watt hour battery the lithium battery that comes with the ultralight 1103 has a GPS unit in it. And right now I'm just drifting because uh, I was scooting along earlier. I'm going 0.7 mile an hour and 0.6 and I'm not moving. Once I start mashing the uh, the throttle here and it's, it's a pretty Im immediate jump up in speed. Uh, it uses, the GPS tells you your speed over land, compares it to the remaining battery percentage, uh, and what your watt draw. Right now I'm using 1113 watts, so a little bit over top end um, watt draw. And what that is telling me is that my remaining range at this speed with, and I have 91% of the battery left, I have 4.1 miles of remaining range at 6.2 miles per hour. So speed, remaining range, battery percentage, watt draw. So it looks like 6.2 is, is right about what I can expect out of this. Um, and you know, for, for about this length, uh, that's, that's doing pretty good. It's not great, but it's, um, I think if it had another two foot of length off the back of this, this hull is really, you know, it is one that's efficient. And if it was a little bit longer, you'd see a lot more gains in speed. Uh, and that's really maybe not what this boat is designed for in terms of speed. It's, it's designed for maneuverability and being that throne go boat um, that really helps you get into a lot of, a lot of places that, um, 
you know, bigger, heavier um, boat is, is not going to do as well in. But I'll go ahead and get the rest of the speed and range data, uh, you know, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, I'll display that and give you uh, the full set of speed and range data. But let me keep zooming back and forth. I'll get that. I'll get over there, set up my tripod, do my donuts. Everyone loves donuts. And uh, give you that data. So, three mile an hour. I'm using 52 watts. That's the first uh, first data point. I'll get the rest. Got all the speed and range data, and I think 6.2 is about what what we can expect out of this. Here and there, it touches 6.3, but it doesn't hold it. It's not consistently on 6.3. Um, I got a little bit of a crosswind here, and I'm at 6.2 in that calm spot by the island. I was 6.2 pretty consistently. Uh, looks like Trey was exactly right. This speed, 6.2 mile per hour, is, uh, <laughs> there, it just touched 6.3. I don't think it can, it can actually claim that, that speed consistently. Testing out in this chop isn't really reliable either. Um, but 6.2, that's our speed. And, um, you know, at that, at that speed, you got 3.9 miles of range at 84% of the battery. Um, we're going to knock it down to, I don't know, it's a good speed. H how many miles are you going to really need in a day? Are you going to need 20? Let's set it on 20 and see what we get. We're looking at this. We're at 18... This is the remaining range number. So we'll, we'll grow that to 20. We'll just back it off at 22. We're using 200 watts and uh, there we're doing 4.6, 4.7 miles. We just adjust it. I know it, it fluctuates some, but you get to where you really feather this in a way that you know, okay, here, here I'm flirting with 20, and I can go 4.6 miles per hour, and uh, I've still, I've already used 17%. So certainly, if you use these more moderate instead of full blast, full blast, eat it up quick. Four and a half, 4.6, you got over 20 miles of range. So. Fun setup. Certainly, you get a lot of uh, maneuverability and lots of uh, lots of range and speed to to get in. Uh, you know, get into some spots that other people just aren't gonna aren't gonna be able to fish. You'll be able to fish them with a the shoulie.